In case you didn't know, Robin is the New York Times bestselling author of more than 40 novels, including the New York Times bestselling River, Virgin River and Sullivan's Crossing series. In her writing, she kind of blends women's fiction and contemporary romance. She develops strong, really likable characters in vivid settings. Her two most famous, of course, include Virgin River, set in the redwood forests of California, and Sullivan's Crossing, a small mountain town in Colorado. Yes. In 2016, Romance Writers of America awarded Robin a Nora Roberts Lifetime Achievement Award. She lives in Las Vegas, Nevada, where she spends her days writing about love and spending time with her grandchildren. Netflix recently released that 10-episode adaptation of Robin's Virgin River series and has announced it's coming back for season two. You were going to ask that question. You don't need to ask that one now. Her newest novel, The Country Guest House, was released on July 7th in case you didn't know. So please welcome Robin Carr. Sorry to be late. I was watching her on TV. She's doing fine. So you're going to let me talk. I'm going to let you talk, okay. and then I'm going to ask a few questions, and then okay. we're letting, more importantly, the folks out here ask some questions. There's a lot of people. Because they got a lot of good questions for you. But I figure you might have a few things to say to start things out. I might. Most everybody already knows this stuff, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> um, when I, um, a few years ago when I attended a writer's conference, um, a woman approached me and said, how'd you do it? How'd you get your fourth book on the New York Times list? And I said, uh, actually, I didn't. I, um, I sold my first book in 1978. And I had my first bestseller in 2008. And I watched as a look of absolute horror <laughs> came over her face. And right then, I knew I was not her beacon of hope. You were not. I was not. I think she has since gone on to make the New York Times list several times much faster than I. But I want to tell you about the Dark Ages. Not very many of you are old enough to even remember it. it um, when, I started, when I started reading romance as a young wife and mother, I, um, I was reading paperback reprints of classic novels, like Anya Seton's Catherine, and um, Rosemary Holly Jarman's The King's Gray Mare. Well, I don't even know if that's the right author and book, Para. Uh, <laughs> and, and there was not much of a mass market industry. And then Kathleen Woodowis and Rosemary Rogers burst upon the scene with their big, fat, sexy, historical romances. And oh my god, it took the world by storm. It, it created an entire industry. At that time, in 75, when those books came out, there was one romance publisher. And overnight, 29 more appeared, <laughs> known as the Romance Wars. Yeah. And it gave a lot of people who had never had a chance an opportunity to be published. It changed everything. And, uh, and, then, and, and then at that time, the American Booksellers Association um, was in charge of the ABA. And, uh, and we didn't have big chain bookstores like Barnes & Noble or Borders or Walden's or any of those. And a lot of us wondered what we were going to do when those big chains came in and, and changed everything for us and changed all the rules. And they did. And then there was a glut in the market, and those romance publishers began to slowly disappear. 
Um, now, publishers are still publishing romance, of course, but those were dedicated romance publishers, and they, and they had a lot to offer the marketplace. And there were so many, people were signing 15 book contracts. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, it seemed to just slowly shut down. Then Harlequin bought Silhouette, and we were back. We had one romance publisher. So that was in the dark ages. Um, now we have, uh, we have new challenges like digital publishing and fewer bookstores and fewer chains and, um, and more uh, online purchases. So it's a whole new set of challenges. But those days, those were the glory days. The Kathleen Widowist days were the glory days. My daughter is, um, I, she wouldn't want me to tell you her age, um, in her 40s. And uh, I made her read a couple of my favorite books from that era. And she said, and I quote, really, mother? Really? <laughs> so anyway. Here we are. I guess I have some questions. Oh, I want to say something else. We were talking in the back room, and I want to know if you agree with me on this. Um, there have been some changes in, in the Virgin River series from the books. I'm sure you noticed them. Some of you wrote me, and you shouldn't talk that way to <laughs> a new friend. Um, there have been some changes. They're necessary. I write books for readers. There's a lot of internal dialogue. There's a lot of narrative. There's a lot of description. There's a lot of stuff that can't be translated into film. It just can't. It won't work. You would be bored to death. I'm saving you from yourself. <laughs> it wouldn't work. You and I, when you read my books, we're alone together. It's usually quite late. Your relationship with me and with the stories I write, which are, by the way, not me, um, is very personal and it's very emotional. And that's why I get letters from people, not to tell me how great I am, but to say things like, I lost my mother last year and your books got me through it. Or, my baby died. And I know just how that character felt. It was spot on. Those are the kind of letters I get because we have such an intensely personal, private, secret relationship. And that is the place my readers go to feel the emotions they're stuck with. Because we all have all those things happen in our lives. And if they haven't happened to us, they've happened to our sister, or our neighbor, or our coworker, or our teacher, or our pastor. So that's why the film is after the action and the dialogue and can't incorporate all that other stuff into the film. My feeling is, my take on the first season is that they did a brilliant job of moving it around in a way that was entertaining and thoughtful. In fact, if I had thought of putting, um, what's her name? Um, 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 what? Faith, is that what you said? Hope, hope and the doctor together. I would have done that, that was a, <laughs> That was a great idea. Why didn't I think of that? So anyway, now you can now go. No, I'm so glad because we were talking about this. So at the end of the day, though, the book is better. The book is always better. That's what we always say. No, it doesn't the book matter. Is, the book is always different. The book is but, always different. Have you ever seen a movie that, that um, outdid the book? Because I did. One of my favorite, uh, favorite movies. Um, shit. I, <laughs> You should not be asking older people to. No, this, this happens to me. It comes to me at 2 in the morning yeah, all the time. It'll, it'll, yeah. it'll come. When it comes, I'm going to shout it out. 
Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so one of the things people want to know is like you did get started when you were a young mom writing romance. Is that still what you're drawn to when you read? Do you still read? I still like romance and women's fiction. Okay. And historical romance. I've never I've never been much of a, a fan of um, of science fiction. And um, and the only boy books I like to read are um, Nelson DeMille. I really love him. Uh, and I can't think, I haven't read a boy book in a while. Um, Stephen King I sometimes like. Uh, That's yeah. funny, a boy book. A boy book. They're yeah, boy. It, it's true. They're, they're boy. I mean, it, it was, um, I, when I was married um, to that man, uh, we never watched a movie unless it had a ball or a gun in it. So I'm not that... Yeah, I, yeah. I'm not no. that girl. No, no. But when you talk about things that have changed since you did and you started in this industry, how do you feel you've evolved and changed in the process and the connection I think you have to your readers? It changes. I mean, just when you think of email and how we communicate with one another, it's changed, I'm sure. You know, I think that the really neat part about being a writer is that it's a process of daily discovery. It's a constant growth and a constant learning process. And it's, um, it's very fulfilling. I mean, if you can look at it like, like that, you're teaching yourself valuable lessons all the time. And no small part of that is, is rejection and change and learning how to cope with, those ki with the kinds of ups and downs that you run into in publishing. Yeah, and, and when you were talking about when you first were kind of discovered, you didn't even really know you were discovered. <laughs> you were like, what? Yeah. Oh, you want to give me an agent? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, it's really kind of, that was really true. I had a, a kind of mentor, he was the novelist in residence at Trinity University in San Antonio, and he had a small critique group, and, um, and he, I read for him in this small, we were all unpublished, I think, and um, he said, Robin, would you like me to find a couple of agents that would look at your work? I can give you the names. And I said, oh, thanks, but I'm just waiting to be discovered. <laughs> and <laughs> dead si I, w I was seven when I did that, okay? <laughs> dead silence in the room, and um, he said, um, Somebody just did discover you. <laughs> now, nothing ever came of that, but uh, that's kind of the interesting things that can happen. You yeah, know, along it's the true way. along the way. I know um, we, I'm, like I said, we want to get to all of you, but but I think some people are wondering about you know you have the redwood forests, a virgin river, of course, in that series and that wonderful setting, but then you also have Colorado in Sullivan's Crossing, so, and that debuted in April of 2016, so why Colorado? What, what connects you to Colorado? Well, it's actually not my first book set in Colorado. Oh, okay. And, um, but you wouldn't know this because it's, this was a secret book. No, it wasn't a secret <laughs> book. <laughs> <laughs> it's a secret um, book that nobody read. Book. Okay. No, <laughs> no, I actually wrote one thriller in my life. And um, at the time, I had just visited Durango. Uh, so and beautiful. we drove around the mountains a lot, and I really fell in love with it. I thought it was great. And, uh, and so I made that the setting of, um, of a book, and I, met, and I met some interesting people while I was writing this book, and it was a thriller, and it was actually a very good thriller, and it sold a lot of, co it's called Mind Trist, you can go read it, it's like 25 years old or something, and it's still scary, and, um, and so uh, people wanted another, another one, publishers were interested in another one, so I tried to write one, and I sent it in, very proudly sent it in, and I said, could you, could you make it like, you know, suspenseful or something, <laughs> I, uh -huh. I thought I had. Uh, so I tried again, another one. I think I tried four or five times and came to the conclusion, I'm not scary, okay? And I'm not. That's not I, your gig. It's not my gig. I never think, 
when I'm in the bathtub, I don't want to be thinking, what if he came at me now? <laughs> you know? This just doesn't work for me. So I'm going to write about housewives and do women doctors and, you know, yeah. that sort of thing. It, it's less scary. <laughs> less scary. Well, I was talking to some people during the break that said they, when you have a new one of your books come out, a glass of wine, your book, and don't bother me, <laughs> please, to anybody else in the family, That's leave me great. alone. It's my time, you know, into the wee hours of morning, just like you when you started reading books and romance genres. No, till late at night. Late at night. It's your time. Yeah. It's your time. Okay, we want to get some questions from the audience, and I know they're going to bring microphones and things around. I mean, do you ever get to a point where you have a favorite, or do you choose no favorites? It's I like have a children. lot of favorites. Oh, you do? I do. Okay. I, um, I do. I really do. Um, one of my favorites, um, I was just, I had lunch today with an old friend who got, is a gardening nutcase, and I said, I wrote a whole book about a gardening nutcase, and <laughs> it was called Wild Man Creek, and I love that book, and it was... It was really a fun book to write, and I loved writing the first Sullivan's Crossing book. I loved it so much that I wanted to keep writing it, so I kept going back to the beginning to see if there wasn't something I could make a little bit better. It was so much fun. They just, the characters just came to life for me. And, and by the way, I'm due one of those. I uh, haven't had one of those in a while, you know, where I... Where you just feel that? Where it just writes itself, and, and I just, it just lay there and... And I just lay back and enjoy it, you know. And experience. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there's some that end that when you're finally finished, you're like. Oh. I know. I'm done. I, I, I'm many. Because it's exhausting. Many. I say worst book I've ever written in my life. No. I do say that. And then I send it in, and sometimes it's not a great book, and they say, we're going to need a little work here. And so <laughs> we, get, we get to work, and we make it as good as we possibly can. And other times they say, um, what are you talking about? This is a great, great book. book. I love this book. I said, well, then OK. Then, All right. I always knew it was. I always I, knew I, that's that. That's how I felt. That's right. <laughs> OK, so we have questions. We have our people with our microphones. First one up. I know there are. Oh, is. you chickens. Anybody got a Xanax? There we go. But of course, it's going to be not necessarily close. Here we go. I really love your books. I've been reading them for about 10 years now, and I have all of them, and I love them. And I was wondering, what made you go from historical to contemporary? It, it's simple. Um, I got burned out on historicals. I just, it's all I was reading, all I was writing, and all I was reading was nonfiction about, um, you know, knights and, and troubadours and kings, and I got really burned out. I said at the time, no more knights and tights. I, <laughs> I can't do it. I just can't. I just couldn't do it for a long time. I didn't even read historicals after that. Uh, it took such a lot of energy and research to, uh, to write a historical novel. Yeah. And, and I, I needed think. to relax a little. Plus, I've always, my first two books that I ever wrote were Shalin, which was the first book published, and a contemporary that I called Beverly and Joe, that somebody eventually published as Tempted. And it's a, it was a little uh, contemporary romp. I was 26 years old wow. when I wrote it. And I loved that book. And nobody else liked it. <laughs> nobody. OK, no, we have a question up here in the back. And they're, they're, good thing you ran up to the top. So uh, I drive a lot. And I use the Access 360 app from the Jeffco Library, which is great. But you only have two Robin Carr books on audiobook. Why? Like, how, how, how determines well, you what need gets to, an audiobook? You need to talk to the acquisitions librarian <laughs> about that. There's clearly been a tragic mistake. I would agree. Because so, you need to drive more and have more access, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So, so well, what determines? 
an audiobook. Like, do you say, oh, I think this would be a great audiobook, and you go find someone to narrate it and put it no, out there? No, no, no. someone else's and choice? Let me tell you how it works, because it's um, completely not that way. Uh, what happens is, um, usually if you're, if you're very little known, the publish, publisher controls the audio rights, and they decide whether or not they want to put the, you know, the energy into the production of, of the audio book. And they hire an audio publisher, and they do the marketing and distribution on the, um, on the audio books. And our biggest customer is the library. In fact, um, uh, Recorded Books is an audio company that's done most of my books. And after the first couple of books were done, I started getting letters about the narrator, who is a beautiful young actress named Therese Plummer. And um, I, I got in touch with the president of Recorded Books, the ballsy thing to do, and said, my readers love Therese Plummer. Can you keep her in work a while? Because they really, really like her. And she has since uh, narrated every book I've I've written, I think, except the older ones. All the Virgin River books, all the Grace Valley books, all the Sullivan's Crossing books. She's, in fact, one night when I was sitting up very late reading someone else's book, I saw her on Law and Order. Oh, really? How interesting. <laughs> yeah, there she was. You have a connection to them, too, I'm sure. OK, here we go. This is a question about dialogue. Yes. I love your dialogue, but I notice as I'm reading some of your books, the dialogue is interspersed with descriptions of what they talked about instead of continuing the conversation. So what makes you decide to do it sometimes as dialogue and sometimes as that description? It, it's just whatever I think in my mind is getting the job done. Sometimes the dialogue goes on for a long time. Other times there's a smitten here and a, then a little description and then a smitten there. And whatever moves the story the best in the right direction, it's an intuitive thing. And I can usually tell if, in my opinion, that story is hitting all the right notes. There's got to be a rhythm to it. And my readers are feeling it, right? So there's no, there's no, no straight technical answer for that. It's an intuitive thing. And probably something that's come with time, where you just think, I know, I know. It's how I'm hearing it. Yeah, how you're hearing it. OK, question, next one. Oh, way down here. OK, she's going to get down to the mic. Hi, I was just wondering, what is your writing process? I mean, do you have the story already internalized in your brain and you sit down and you can just whip it out or do you do it maybe by scenes and then add stuff around it or maybe it varies? Well, here's what I like. This is the most fun. I love this question, by the way, too, because I used to have this program in, in my library system called Car Chat, and that was my favorite question to ask the people who were the authors who I was interviewing. Yeah. Um, I like to fly by the seat of my pants. Now I, now I like, I have to know something. I have to know who's in the story and what kind of story it is, and, and vaguely, at least, where it's going. Um, and then I like to start on page one because I like to discover what's going to happen too. I mean, I, I like to wait. I, something comes to me on page 160. I am perfectly willing to go back to page one. In fact, some of the best things have happened in revision. Like, um, mm. do, who knows who Ricky Sutter is? Anybody know? They know. He is one of the most beloved characters in Virgin River. I had written four Virgin River books. <clears throat> and somebody said, I think it was my agent, said, something's missing. What could, what's missing from this? Mm. And we talked about a hundred possibilities. And then she said, maybe a teenage boy. 
ding, oh. ding, 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 ding. I mean, with Jack being a single man, yeah. a teenage boy without a father in the town who needs someone to mentor him, I went back to the beginning of the first book and wrote him into four books. It's the best decision I ever made. How so, hard is that, though, to write somebody in after you've written that many? There's a delete key. Okay. <laughs> All righty. There's, a, there's an insert key. Insert, delete. Yeah. And you Backspace. Said, and but we talked a little bit backstage writing, like, do you write, like, can you write when you're doing tours, when you're doing, you said you don't no. like, you like writing at home. Yeah. I like writing at home when there is nobody else breathing my air. <laughs> I heard Nora say that, so I've decided it's mine now. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I like to be. I like to be alone. Yeah. Do you always have another one in your head? Always. Not always. Not Somet always. Sometimes there's nothing up there. <laughs> now there's there, there's tricks. Um, oh, I can have a brainstorming session with my editor and her boss. Yeah. And and we can talk about. Like, what, what are some of the things that we haven't done that we should do? In one of those brainstorming uh, sessions years ago, and I don't even remember who was in it. It might have been my last editor, for all I know. I, um, uh, somebody said, I have a friend who's found out her husband had an affair years ago, but it lasted for two years. And I said, can I write about that? And he said, yeah, she'll never know. <laughs> and I did. And it was one of my favorite books. And when I started that book, I didn't know if that husband was just a fallible man, a good but fallible man, or if he was a real bastard. And I couldn't wait to find out. So off we go, <laughs> right? I love it. Brainstorming sessions probably get a lot going yeah. and thinking. All right, next question. Oh, we have one right here. Fight over which side the microphone goes with. I'm a huge fan of yours. Um, I discovered you last year and read all your Virgin River books um, before the show came out. I'm like, oh my goodness, the show's coming out. But I read them all in three months, I think, maybe two and a half. Um, your house I'm is filthy, is that what you're saying? <laughs> Actually, I read them all in audiobook, so I was productive. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but um, I wanted to ask, I, I fell in love with your characters, and I just wanted to know where you get your inspiration for such strong, specifically the female characters, such strong women that are independent and feisty. Well, they're us. They're yeah. us. Come on, girls. I love it. They're everywhere, and they're us. And the men? Perhaps a bit idealized. <laughs> oh my nah, I kid you. You're wonderful, man. <laughs> You're here. I look at you. <laughs> I'm sorry that I'll, I'll never forget that. <laughs> it's 100% accurate. <laughs> So uh, do you meet people, though, when you same thing? Like I do. Like meet a woman or see or hear a story about a strong woman and say, I do. Like that. I eavesdrop. And, um, and I hear things. Yeah. And I see things. And people tell me things about their friends. And, and that really doesn't mean that you need to write to me and tell me about your divorce. I'm good on that. <laughs> believe me. Yeah. <laughs> but, not dear but, Abby. No, it's not. But okay. <laughs> I, but I really do. I meet remarkable women. And, um, and men, and I, uh, and I listen to what they're saying, and, and I listen, I hear tidbits about how they're living and what their problems are. I was just buying a pair of pants at Chico's, and the sales lady said she was divorced after over 40 years, and now her husband wants to come home because the woman he left her for is beating him up. <laughs> and I said, oh, please be still, my heart. <laughs> 
Do you I go back and buy another pair of pants? Yeah. Oh, I yeah. would. I'd be like, I gotta keep hearing more. Bought out the whole store. <laughs> I mean, but but that's kind of that's kind of how it happens. So you talk to you're talking to the waitress. You get a story. You're you know, you're. I mean, it's um, it's a it's a constant adventure. And then I have an idea. I I, and this sounds this sound very arrogant. I apologize in advance. I want my characters, most of my characters, to be able to serve as role models for my readers. My readers are looking for answers. They have issues. We all have issues. We're hurting sometimes. And we're sad and lonely sometimes. Uh, and there's help. There's always a happy ending. And uh, somewhere, Sometimes it's at the end of a long strain of counseling, but there's always, there's always a happy ending, and I want my reader, my my characters to be strong, intelligent, insightful, and and capable of finding a solution to the problems we face in everyday life. Is that asking too much? I don't think so. I think that's that's a good plan, and I, if it helps. And I think it works. I think it makes uh, I think it makes the books good. What do you think? Yeah. Next question. Where are we? Oh, way up top. You guys are getting your exercise in. All your steps. There you go. All your glutes are going to be burning tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hello. I'm sorry, I'm not as familiar with all of your books as some people here probably are, but my question is, do you have or do you plan to have any handicapped characters? Oh, yes, the book that just came out has a, a little boy with cerebral palsy. And he, and he gets around on Australian crutches. What about women? Women, I haven't. Have I had any handicapped women? I can't think. I don't believe I have, but I'm, I'm not shy. Of, I'm not shying away from that. I think that's a that, that's a worthy idea. Yes, because they can be very strong in their own way too. You know, they can be very strong. They can serve as role models. And um, and listen, uh, uh, everybody is beautiful. Everybody is a, a, a very lovely man said to me, you don't fall in love with a face and a body. If you do, you'll be sorry. Yeah, you will. You feel, fall in love with a heart and a soul. So. That was pretty good. It was, wasn't for it? For a man to come yeah, up Yeah, for a man. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Some deep thinking. That was very deep. <laughs> I'll pass that along. I know. <laughs> um, okay, well, I think we're close to. I thought I saw another hand right there. Here we go. In that general area, I'm not going to make you run anymore. Hi, it's a real treat to meet you. Um, I started reading your books because I was in the library one day, and uh, my maiden name is Carr. And I thought, oh, well, I should try. She's got a lot of books on the shelf. And so I've been following your books for a while. I have, actually have a new grandson named Carson, spelled with both R's. Really? Yes. And so. Um, How you, you doing, a, sis? You like those books? You know, I, I felt so. I felt very bonded to you because of our names. Aww, I'm very fond so, of you. So, so it's a real treat to meet you. But my question has always been, I love your settings, and that's part of when I read. I like going into the setting that it is. So do you go to these settings, or do yes. you, you create them in your? I create them, imagine? and then I go to them, and then sometimes I'm in. I'm doing things backwards. I wrote the first um, couple of Virgin River books before I went to Humboldt County, and I went with my my closest friend at the time, um, who is coming to visit me in a week. She's eighty frickin' three years old now. Wow! I, I just do not know how that happened. She went with me to Humboldt County. We got, we were on, I think it's Highway 5 that goes right up the center of the state, isn't it? Uh, and, and we found Highway 36 on the map that goes right over to the coast. 
And I said, oh, this is a piece of cake. It says it's a highway. So let's get on this highway and go and have lunch. Five hours later, later. <laughs> after being beaten up by logging trucks and grow, illegal growers, yeah. it was, I thought, I thought I was going to die. I was so exhausted. It was terrifying. There were places that road got down to one lane. And people with, um, uh, this was a, a very suspicious amount of, um, of uh, PVC piping and chicken shit in the back of their trucks <laughs> were trying to run us off the road, honk on the horn. And it was, it was terrifying. And I thought, this place is much more removed and remote than, than the pictures depicted it, or than, than I thought it was. And I went, had to go back to the beginning and really adjust the setting because that was important. I'm a setting snob. You have to, that setting has to require something of the characters. It has to be not easy. It has to be tough. It has to have texture. It can't be moved to a pretty little town, lots of picket fences. I think I'll sell cupcakes for a living. That just won't, that just isn't, that just isn't gritty enough for me. So, so in the places I've chosen so far, um, you have to, you have to know what you're doing to, to exist in a, this isn't an easy place. Colorado's not an easy place. You have all kinds of issues with fires and, and storms and all kinds of stuff going on. So, and then you have the unrivaled beauty of it. Yeah. I mean, how can you, you just can't do any better than that. Yeah, setting's important. And yes, I go there. Yeah. So when you go there, you go there before well, or sometimes see, during, but then you, what, mentally take snapshots? Well, most your of the time, if you're smart, you go there before. Right. That's, well, when you said the one thing, yeah. Yeah, so my fatal mistake, I had to rewrite four yeah. books because it really was much more important than I, it was different than I had described it. I had a pretty little country road. Yeah. I didn't have all those growers. Yeah. In fact, how those growers came to be, um, I went, I, this was such an auspicious occasion, I went to a little community called Boonesboro in California actually to listen to Alice Walker read. And um, I, I idolized her, so it was a big moment. And then a couple days later, I was standing on the side of the road with one of the locals and a black hawk flew over. Now you can't, there's no mistaking a black hawk. And I said, I didn't know you had an army post out here. And he said, that's not army, that's DEA. We have the biggest pot growing area in the oh. United States. <laughs> and I said, you do? <laughs> I want to see that. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. So I, I called the sheriff and um, Asked about the pot growers. He talked my leg off. I bet it he was, did. It was great. You know, the thing, the thing I've learned about research is um, if you're nice and prepared, people will tell you absolutely anything. If you're asking them about themselves, they'll talk forever. Look at me. <laughs> they want to be listened to. Yeah. Really? At people want to be listened to. Yeah. So when you go to that setting, then do you take notes? Do you take photos? Take pictures, take, take notes. Go to people in key positions of uh, power and knowledge. Go right to the police department uh. and say, I'm writing a book. And here's a couple of copies of my, my earlier books. And I'd like to know about the town and crime in the town. Uh. And can we talk? Go to the firehouse. They love it when you go to the firehouse. Because they sit around until the fire happens. That's right. So they talk a lot. They'll they let tell you, you write, they stories. let you sit on their machines. Yes. <laughs> and they know how to cook. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's, um, it's wonderful. Do not go see the illegal growers. They're not as friendly. <laughs> 
they don't open the door and come on in. <laughs> so um, one of the questions in the audience is they said, you know, there's a lot of medical nursing um, staff and characters in your book. What interests you in medicine? Oh, I went to nurses training. I didn't finish. I went to, um, and I remember this is the um, Vietnam period. Um, I went to a three-year RN program in St. Paul, Minnesota, and after completing two years, my then husband uh, got um, drafted. Ooh, okay. And so um, we either had to get married or think about not getting married. And. Um, well, I was 19, there was no, nobody, you can't live. If, I was 19 in 19, if, what was it, 71. I mean, you can't, you couldn't live unless you got married, right? So, so we got married and went to, uh, our next adventure was in the military. Mm -hmm. And uh, fortunately for him, he did not go to Vietnam. So that was, that was a lucky break. But I started checking into completing my third year right away and if I couldn't go to school in Minnesota, where the first two years were, I wasn't going to be able to do it. And then they quickly converted to a two-year RN program, and I was not um, eligible for that. So, uh, so my son, so I made my son a doctor. Oh well, that's good. It's always good to have a doctor in the family. Always good. That's what everybody says. Yeah. So, so yeah. you still, obviously, you know a lot about it, and you can go to him. I like medicine. When it came to um, medicine is fun. I, I midwives, a midwife de delivered my children, um, and uh, I have a best friend who is a nurse practitioner, women's health, and um, she introduced me to a midwife who's worked in both urban and rural areas so I could get all the yeah. technical stuff right. Um, and it's easy to, easy to research. And, and my daughter's a cop. You got so, stories coming out the yin yang. I like cops. Yeah. I like cops oh, and well, firemen no and doctors and lawyers. I like lawyers. You do? I do. You like like them? Or I you just like, like their, the, his, their the, the job? I, well, the job, I guess. The job. Yeah. It's interesting. But I have a lot of friends who are lawyers, and they're, yeah. they're, they're very interesting. OK, next question. I know we I missed somebody before. She's going to make oh, you. Oh, right here. I was going to say in the middle. Right here, right in the middle. I, mean, I can see better from this angle than you can. I'm sorry about that. Hi. I was just wondering if you have a favorite time of day to write, um, and then also if you work on more than one book at a time, or do you work on multiple books when you write? One book at a time. I, I'm not, um, I can't really multitask that well. Uh, but I work every day, every day that I'm not someplace else. And um, uh, I start in the morning with coffee, I usually go through my emails like everybody else does, and uh, and I, I tinker with it all day long, and it takes, and then I if I don't have an idea, I either go clean a bathroom or um, throw a load of wash in or um, play solitaire. <laughs> so you know, you, I mean, you're supposed to play solitaire, right? That's what I thought you were supposed to do with that. If I if I kind of stay with it all day long, from the hours of four to six, I can get a lot done. It seems like, obviously I've been doing this for 42 years, I can type 122 words a minute. Wow. But I can't think that fast. <laughs> so if it's going well, by the end of the day, I might only have three pages done by four o'clock, but I might write 10 in two hours. Because wow. I'm fast. But I have to have an idea. And there's no rush in that, boy. They come when they damn well please. So when you have a good day, though, at the end of the day, do you just, are you able to shut, shut off and go to sleep and say, I'll pick it back up tomorrow? No, I, um, I stop working and go listen to Lester Holt. Oh, you do? Yes, <laughs> I do. Lester. Okay. I like Lester. I watch the news. I have some dinner. 
And, um, you know, I wind down. You have to decompress a yeah. little bit. And when I was younger and I was, I was writing full time and raising children and cleaning the house and ironing <laughs> shirts and, um, you know, doing all of that stuff, I remember one time driving across the, the railroad tracks and the train came. Right, but I mean, there had been no lever to go down. Oh, and I thought my brain was, so, was in such a different place that I didn't see the train. And I thought, wow, I, I'm gonna have to be more careful about, <laughs> about decompressing because I can be literally in another world. I would think to yeah. do that. I know this quite, right here. Okay, I don't wanna. When I saw your hand, I was like, let's get to it. Hi, Robin. Hi. I have a question for you about your writer tribe. So as a fellow writer, I count on my writing tribe a lot. And when I get stuck, I call them up and ask them for advice and, and maybe just like, let's knock around some ideas and talk about how, you know, we can... How can I do this? What's an idea for a festival that I can have? Because I've already had 20 festivals already. What's a new festival I can have? So would you talk a little bit about your writing tribe? And if you still, at this point, after so many years, do you still count on your writing tribe? Well, um, there, there are people I can call. I don't, I don't get together with um, writers for a, a plotting session or anything like that. But listen, by now, I know everybody, OK? Everybody. <laughs> And we, and we run into all the same people all the damn time. And they're all, they're all at the same writers' conferences or book fests. But I have a few close friends um, whose work I really love. Mariah Stewart is a close friend. Um, Kristen Higgins is a close friend. Susan Elizabeth Phillips is a close well, I've known some of these people for so long. I think I've known Susan Elizabeth for 35 years. Hell, I've known Nora that long. I know Nora since she was Ellie. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what Jenny was saying backstage. You guys get together and just everybody talks about, right? I mean, you're, you speak your own language, I yeah, think. We probably do. That others don't understand necessarily in your world. But I do, I have, I have told people, I'm having a terrible time with this plot. What can I do? And um, Kristen Higgins gets, gets the points for what I think is one of the best scenes I've ever written. And it's at the beginning of what we find when uh, Maggie, a neurosurgeon, is hiding in a stairwell to cry. Because she can't let the boy doctors see her cry. She's a neurosurgeon. She can't cry. Do you know what my son said when he read that? She's a neurosurgeon. She can't cry. Uh. Said, thus the stairwell, you see. Proved my point. Next question. I missed a couple of hands. Oh, there we go. Hey, Robin. Um, you've mentioned more than once where you've had to go back and revise some of the earlier books. Yes. And then my question is, what happens then if those books are already in print, just the next print that comes out has the revisions in oh, it? Oh no, I don't revise anything that's already okay. been in print. In fact, I'm kind of snooty about that too. I think um, uh, there's been a lot of talk lately about revising printed books before reissuing them. I, I like the idea that um, we can study an author and see where they've been and where they're going and, the, and, and start a discourse on the changes, and that's valuable information. And that's intellectualizing a craft. And, um, and uh, the study of it is, is important to would-be writers and to people who just are studying literature. I, um, I put my first historicals, which some of which I don't, and some parts of which I don't think are brilliant. Uh, back in print because they need to be available. They should be available to be read. As, and that is what she did at that time. 
based on what she knew at that time. That's important information, I think. It's pure. It's being authentic to yourself, too, yes. and, and the, the evolution that you have had That's as an right. author. When you, and I, if, raise your hand, Bill, we have runners getting to you. When you talk about these strong women, because you've been writing for more than five years, um, do you look in the women that you see in your life or view and think that women have changed that much? I mean, we still, uh, women have been caring for others and finding, making strong, tough decisions for a long, long time and have flaws, but do you see them changing now? I, I stomped for the Equal Rights Amendment in 19, what was it, 78, 80? Um, we haven't come far enough. Yeah. There's still, I mean, I can't believe we're still fighting some battles. It's unbelievable to me. We should have come much further. Yeah, we need to talk about equal pay and everything else. That's and right, equal pay country. and how about sexual assault? The Me Too movement we talked about and the impact it has yeah. on romance writers. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. um, we're, we're not coming, we're making progress. It's just not fast enough. Yeah. Some of these things, I just, I can't believe we're asking these questions. Yeah. Oh, here we go. I was just curious where Sullivan's Crossing is in Colorado. You know, I'm not really sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'd need a map and a bo drawing board and a poker. To, but um, it looked to me on the map like there was this area uh, by, um, by Leadville. Oh, okay. That, that was, Leadville's got the highest airport yes. in the world, right? Isn't there a valley south of Leadville? That's kind of where I envisioned, because there are mountains all around it. And you can get on the um, Continental Divide from there, right? Yeah. So roughly that area. But uh, come on, it's fiction, OK? I mean, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah? Ah. Here's our question in the middle right here. Yeah, you know, when you think of Colorado, there's a lot of places that kind of fit some of those areas in the yeah. mountains. So Robin, I'm interested in how you process ratings and reviews, say, through Amazon. When people read your books and leave a review, do you, do you worry about the one stars? Do you think to yourself on some of the five stars, wow, that person really probably should have written my book. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, um, first of all, I'm not sure all the one stars are people who read the book and didn't like it. Yeah. Sometimes they can, they, people torpedo other writers, especially when you notice that that one star review came from somebody who hasn't been known to review many books and, her, and their name is Amazon Customer. <laughs> might not be a real person. Um, and and I'm, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm, I'm trying to quit reading reviews. Yeah. The, um, the really negative reviews uh, are painful. And, um, and they're also, I think, unnecessary. Amazon reviews and, and Goodread reviews, for that matter, are opinions. And the people who are uh, posting them need to remember that real living, breathing human beings who worked very hard are going to be on the receiving end of that opinion. And I, and I don't mind a bad review. I remember Kirkus once said, I had a heroine who was a limp oat cake. <laughs> what? I don't know what a limp oat cake was, but I didn't like that. But, you know, it was at least showed some skill you know, in writing. I, um, 
I wish I didn't read reviews at all because the, because the negative ones, I can get 100 really good reviews and that feels real nice and I can get one really mean one and it hurts. And it sticks with you. And it's I'm like you tough. can get, let's say, yeah, doesn't that? And I'm tough. Have you gotten tougher? Well, probably a little bit, but you know, I, I think about what it does to the, um, I've seen young, Start starting out writers younger than I just be brought to their knees by a horrible review. I don't. And, and, and you know what? Those reviews are opinions, doggone it. We used to have real live critics that we sent books to. Now anybody can leave an opinion. It's not, it's not a trained, educated in literature critic. No. Some, some. In fact, most of the time, their, gra their grammar, punctuation, and syntax is so I was so going to say, if, you can't, if they can't spell or so that, yeah. yeah. Take it for what it's worth then, right? That's right. Take it for what it's worth. But good question. Where was our next question? Right here? Did I miss it? Yeah, here we go. Thanks. I was just curious how the Netflix series came about. What kind of input did you get to have into that? And then what everybody's wanting to know is when season two is coming out. Oh, I don't know anything about season two. Netflix is really, really is in charge. And, um, and they tell me when they want me to know or <laughs> maybe when they think they want the world to know. I don't know. I, they've, they've, um, they've had a lot of secrets. They don't want to publicize it until they're ready to publicize it. How it came about was... Um, well, first of all, my agent is always on the lookout for production companies that are interested in that kind of work. And uh, a producer, and there, and there has been a lot of interest along the way. Uh, uh, I was very um, particular about what kind of production company was going to take it on because the Virgin River people swear and have sex. Are we clear? <laughs> and I didn't want that, them to be mushed down. I wanted them to be real, edgy people. And, uh, and so Netflix was perfect. So when they, um, the producer optioned the work, she pitched it to Netflix, who, who bought it. And, um, and they, and they put the contract together that doesn't really call for me to do anything. Now, I could throw, go throw my weight around, I suppose, yeah. but um, this would not be good for the series. I don't make movies. I make books. I could go get involved and easily really muck up the whole thing. It could have been, I could have made it terrible in one day. <laughs> so I'm leaving the movie making to people who actually make movies. But you've written a screenplay. I've written a screenplay, yeah. In the past. And I can read them. I saw the first couple of scripts for the first couple of Virgin Rivers. and. Um, and they were good. And I thought, these are really good, but they're not exactly like my book. That was my <laughs> first thought. And I thought, see, this is not, I'm not a good person to do this. Know your lane, right? Stay in your lane. Stay do in what your you lane. Do. Stay That's in right. your lane. OK. This question, oh, do we have down here another one? I, I, but you said you did go to Hollywood. Try that thing briefly. Didn't like it. That whole Hollywood experience. Oh yeah, experience. I wrote I wrote a, a, several scripts with a, a, some with a writing partner who had sold movie scripts, and um, the whole the whole way that they work in a room with you know yelling out the next line and f arguing over the it's just um, it's just not going to work for me. Yeah. I am um, I'm by myself in my pajamas, <laughs> and. Uh, and that's how it's going to be. Yeah, that's your place. That's, that's my your place. Safe place. Okay. What advice would you give to a new author with finding an agent and a publisher to get their book out in print? I think you should listen to all the tips and wait for the planets to all line up in a specific way. 
and then it's right. No, I think you should get an agent. Um, I, you should expect the agents, the, the first 20 that you try, to turn you down just because they're only looking for a specific thing or it just didn't um, ring their bells. And it doesn't have anything to do with you particularly. I've had I don't know how many agents, but the one I have now used to be my editor and uh, 30 years ago, and I think, I think I'm taking this one to the grave. But, um, but it's, uh, it's very, very hard. Oh, I, I, there are so many disappointments in publishing. You, you really have to be strong and determined and keep on doing what you're doing, and don't let anybody tell you you're, you can't be published or you're not good enough. The first editor I pitched the Virgin River series to said, it'll never work. Mm. I cried all the way home. It'll never work. So you still take, you still feel the pain of rejection. Sure. Somebody doesn't like it after all these years. Sure. And then you find out, the next thing you find out is when it does work in a big way, Victory has many fathers. <laughs> it was everybody else's idea, for sure. Yeah. And, you know, I, I had a book that was, um, was going to be a breakout book, a big breakout book. And back in the day, they didn't give you information over the phone like, we've shipped 75,000 copies or anything. They didn't tell you anything. But in this instance, this book that had previously been scheduled to print 15,000 copies or something, was printing and shipping 100,000 copies. It was going to be part of a special Reading at Sea program. It was going to take me to the moon. I was so excited. I had to wait for the royalty statement to come to see how well it did. And it came. And I called my daughter and my good friend and said, meet me at Claim Jumpers. I'm buying. Order wine. <laughs> and they did. And I opened the envelope. And it was $7. <laughs> Didn't even pay for my glass. And the end of the story is, we never did find out what went wrong. It was like a train went off the track. 75,000 books were returned. And it was a disaster. And we had to start over and rebuild. And we started over and rebuild. And so can you. It's hard work. Yeah, this isn't for sissies, this yeah. job. Yeah. <laughs> By no means. Um, this question is, what role has the library played in your life? Oh, the library is very special to me, always has been. From the time I was a little girl and went with my grandmother and, um, and collected books, I always had such ambitions for the books I was going to read. You know, those big, thick ones yeah. with small print, and I couldn't get through a page. Uh, but um, when I got to Henderson, Nevada 20 years ago, they were excavating down the street, and it was going to be for a new library. And so I went to the existing library and found the director and introduced myself and said, how can I help? And she said, oh, you can do a lot of things for us. And so in the course of about 12 years, I, um, I had friends who were best-selling authors come to the library. And I wasn't a best-selling author, <laughs> but they were come to the library and sign books and fund for fundraisers and things. I uh, started a program called Car Chat, which I interviewed authors who came to town. And, in, and it brought the author to the community and the community nice. to the author. It was a nice program. I was on their board of trustees for four years. I thought that would either bore me to death or kill me. But um, I loved it. It was really great fun. I hated it when I was done. Um, but I, I'm, the library is very important to me, and it's very important to the community. Yeah. And we floated a referendum for money to uh, enlarge the library. And, you know, we see the dem demographics, and we see who's voting for us and who's not. And um, 
that library didn't pass a, a small referendum to, um, to add to the libraries in the city, and yet it is standing room only every day. Every day. Every day. Wow. In fact, you can't find a parking place. I Imagine. usually go in there and say, he's giving away pizza again. What's going on in here? Doesn't that make you feel so good? It makes me feel I mean, so can, good. Yes, and gives you hope, does yeah. it not? Yeah. yeah. And inspiration. Um, I don't know if we had another question really close. Yes, we did. Hey, Robin. Uh, I love everything you've ever written, but the Virgin River series you know, holds a special place in my heart. It's been a little while since you released a book in that setting. Do you think that you'll ever write there again? I might. I mean, I might now because, um, because the, uh, the Netflix series has become so popular and it's, it's creating um, a whole new image for me, so I might. I've been talking about it. Um, yeah, I wrote the last one, I think, in um, 2011, I think. But I, it, having said that, 20 is a lot. And, yeah. you know, I mean, 21 books, not very many people can stay with a location and a set of characters that long. That's really hard to do. But it's a, it's a special place, and um, people love it. And I'm thinking of ways that I can uh, go back to Virgin River. And it, it's a good thing when people say they want more. That is. It makes it's you know that thing. it's good. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions I know that came, we wanted to get to is a key theme in the country guest house is family. And the idea that family is something you create for yourself through the people you surround. Are your family relationships a source of inspiration? I know you mentioned your son and your daughter, so I guess do yeah, they... they now, finally, they live... Um, well, Jamie has always... My daughter has always lived nearby, so I see her kids regularly. My son was um, I, an army surgeon for 17 years. Wow. so He was I, all over. He was all over, and he was in some very unsavory places. And, uh, and when, he was, um, when he was in Iraq, we Skyped every day, every day. And you know, it was kind of funny because um, I would hear that Skype alarm and, and, and I would think, oh, geez. <laughs> uh. I can't tell him I can't talk. He said, I rapped. <laughs> I mean, so, so, hello, you know, I would take, take the call. But we talked every single day while he was in Iraq and, and really became close. And, so I spend a lot of time with my children. Yeah. And do they think you're cool and you're great? Do they think I'm cool? I bet they do. Don't they? I mean, they, don't they brag don't about you? Do you think I'm yes, cool? Yes, and I'd be, bragging, <laughs> I'd be bragging about you every day. Yeah, I think they think I'm cool. Yeah. I think that it really got emphasized when, um, when it, they could see it on TV. That's what that, I was going to say. That made me real. It was like, you, know. you, t you were, now you're the ultimate cool hipster at ultimate, a new level. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, just, I just think that's so interesting. Okay, also another one in the fifth book in Sullivan's Crossing series, and kind of leaves the view readers hungry for more. So do you have plans for a sixth installment? Well, yeah, I do. Sure. I just okay. don't know exactly when I'm going to do that. I just okay. finished a book, and it wasn't a Sullivan's Crossing book. So, um, so I have like, you know, I have like three days to think about what I'm going to do next. So when you finish a book, do you just take a break? Do you no. say, I'm going to take a vacation for there's a second? Never, there's never time to take. It, you, it, the books are in production for a long time. Yeah. It's like a baby. It's like birth. a baby. Yeah. yeah. So you need to stay on it. So there, sure, there are days I don't write, but usually it's because I'm doing something else. Oh, OK. What, I, what, what struck me when we talked backstage, and I know if you have a question, raise your hand so I can get our runners to us, if somebody does, is uh, you call yourself an introvert. I am. Do you want to know how you can tell? Um, introverts are um, exhausted by putting themselves out there and being with a lot of people. I will sleep like a dead person tonight. <laughs> Extroverts are energized by okay. putting themselves out there. 
extroverts can, I mean, you don't have any trouble writing while there are people breathing your air. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. I didn't know that. When yeah. you said that, I was like, I don't picture you as an introvert. No, I am. And, and I'm not shy. No. I, you could also be shy. Sure. You could be an introvert who's also shy. And I love people, and I love being with people. It takes a lot out of me. So do you put a little bit of yourself into characters? Sure, sometimes. Sometimes. Not, and sometimes not on purpose. Yeah, you can't help yeah, it. Can't help it. And your and your daughter will say, Whoa, is that over you? <laughs> yeah, that kind of thing. When they start, you know, when yeah. we start talking like our mothers and yeah. our grandmothers, then we know. It's then right. she's the same. Do we have a yes, we have a question. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, going back to when you had young kids and you were writing, um, and speaking of which being an introvert. I think a lot of people in here are writers and probably introverts. Um, do you have any advice for, um, my husband and I adopted our three little daughters all at once from foster care, and I'm well, also a writer. Go. And so to suddenly have three children you need to feed and things, <laughs> and um, trying to be a writer, it's just a crazy time. I finished a book, but it's, it's um, a time of now marketing and that kind of stuff. What, how did you handle balance back then? I think I just feel very unbalanced at times. Dinner and I was never that. balanced. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I said this in a speech once before, so you've probably heard it. My husband used to like to come home and find the children all bathed and ready for yes. bed. <laughs> Except they'd been in their pajamas all day. Right. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't need to know that. <laughs> yeah. and, it, and it was hard. And it was so, it's, let me tell you this. It, you, are you about 40, 35? Yes, right about there. Some, some place in there. <laughs> um, it is never going to be this hard again. These are the hardest years of your life. You are earning and, and deciding where you want to be in your, in your, ultimately, in your career. You're deciding what your growth rate is. You're deciding what you can do for your, for your children and for your el elder parents. You're, you have a million responsibilities. It's your earning years. You have to worry about sending people to frickin' college. Okay. And, and it's the hardest job you will ever do. And you're trying to keep your relationships safe and in balance. And sometimes it feels like, uh, like there's so much at stake. Because guess what? There's so much at stake. Your children, your marriage, your family, your friendships. This is the hardest it is ever going to be. It's never going to be this hard again. You're going to grow through this stage somehow, doing it your way. And by the way, you are very beautiful. And, it's, and you're going to get it done. And you're going to look back on it and, like, and stupidly miss those days when you, were, when you were young and the kids were tearing at you and you were trying to write a sex scene. <laughs> But you wouldn't trade it. You wouldn't trade older, the, the later time. In your 40s, 50s, you would not trade that for perky boobs and thinner thighs. I promise you. <laughs> it's going to be all right. You hang in there. I don't think everybody's gone through that. And it's not just a girl thing. The men go through it, too. Oh, yeah. It's the 40s, those 30s and 40s are very, very tough, hard-working years. Take care of your health. Yeah. That when you, when you talk about that and you mention male characters, what, how do you find the strengths and the vulnerabilities in your male characters? How do I find it? Yeah, how do you think of those? Well, you, Develop ha it? you have to put them in a, a, in a scene in which they show vulnerability. And, yeah. 
and um, usually you have to usually have to trap them with a whip and a chair. <laughs> but um, it, it, the best way to to develop those kinds of um, uh, characteristics in male characters is to show them responding that way. Yeah. I can't think of an example. I wish I could. If I were just if I were just trying to write it, I'd be coming up with something. But um, well, you brought up the sex scenes. Well, yeah. How long do they take to write? Since you can write so oh, fast. Oh God. They, the ones that are quick, they go through and like, yeah. no, they take all day. They, oh my God, it's so hard to write a sex scene. <laughs> it is. It's really? So, it really is. It really is. First of all, it's you're just a like the bit. actors that talk. These beautiful people that say it's the hardest job ever when they have to do the sex scene. Well, it's a little embarrassing for one thing. Yeah, there's that. Right? Okay. And and you feel a little bit vulnerable yourself when you're trying. You're wondering. You keep seeing Aunt Mary, you know, <laughs> when she's the grimace on her face when she's reading it. Look what little Robbie did. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's hard to do, but so important. Your readers don't um, don't like having the door slammed in their face. Mm -hmm. If they uh, they want some satisfaction too, it's not just the characters in the book who deserve satisfaction. The reader deserves satisfaction in everything. If somebody's winding up for a good punch, let them go. If you don't introduce a, a gun into a story unless you're going to shoot it, yeah. So. So, and it, it's romance, so. Uh, so, yeah. so, yeah. So don't introduce that thing if you're not gonna uh, shoot If you're not gonna <laughs> go that direction. <laughs> Just go down that path. <laughs> that's why Netflix is a good format. Uh, that's why it's Netflix is a good <laughs> place for me, yes. <laughs> uh, do, but do you think, though, that you know, sometimes, I mean, there's that question when you read this that's like, okay, I, what I think is their characters are real life because they have real life problems. But like that romance that, like you're saying, that never exists in real life. You don't feel that way, I'm sure? No? This is, that it isn't real life? I mean, don't you feel like that is? Because you introduce these characters that have their own flaws. And yes, you can still have romance with yes. all these other yes, problems. Yes, you can have, still have romance and love. Love is better than romance. Yeah. Uh, total love is even better than, um, than, than real love and true love and all those other kinds of love. The, the, when you, um, the joy of being loved for yourself. It's the most beautiful thing. The joy of being loved when, you're, when your hair falls out. Yeah. The joy of having somebody rub your bald head and say, I love you. I love you so much. And that kind of joy, every human being deserves to feel that kind of joy. The joy of having somebody love your pot belly and your flat butt. <laughs> Just a couple of the things I love about you, darling. <laughs> but no, no, I'm being no, I'm being silly. I, it's a it's a total total love is a is a wonderful beautiful thing, and um, that's what I strive for when I'm writing a story about lovers. Yeah, is I want them to be the best, the most remarkable, the most devoted, the most dedicated. It takes a great deal of strength to properly love a person. Yeah. Courage. So that's my lesson for today, y'all. That was a good one, though. That was, a, wasn't that? <laughs> and do we do, did I miss one? I thought we had a question. No? Are we good with questions from the audience? No. I thought y'all are. Here's one right here. Yeah. You should write a self-help book next. I should. I you should. actually should. Since I know everything, right? Yeah. Well, you She can. thinks she knows everything. <laughs> um, I, I was introduced to you through the Thunder Point series. And I loved that, that first book. I was like in love with it. But I didn't realize it was a series. And then I found out 
like about a year later, well, I was reading another book and I was like, wait a minute, these characters sound so sound familiar, familiar. <laughs> but it's not the same book. And then I realized it was a series. So then I ran through every single thing you ever wrote. So I've, I love your books. Are you thinking about maybe adding to that Thunderpoint series? Well, now that one is a much easier one to answer. I, I mean, you can add to any series, but I don't know how, how you felt about the characters in that book, but I wrapped that up. There was nobody. I was hoping though. There was nobody left in that town, not even the postman that didn't get a book. So. If I add to that but somebody series, somebody can always drive through see, town. You see what I'm talking about? Yeah, somebody would have to drive through town and have a flat. And <laughs> yeah, I miss Coop. Yeah, <laughs> that's so funny <laughs> that you wrap. Do you, when you look at this life, this life of writing, um, it's brought you a lot of joy, a lot of happiness. Oh, every day. Rejection, everything, yes. the whole bit. Yes. But you have to be that kind of person. Yeah. There are a lot of people that I know that I have known for 20, 30, 35, 40 years who are the most miserable writers on the face of the earth. Oh, my Lord. They are suffering so. They are such a tra that they're so classic tragic classic writer, yes. Yeah, tragic writers. I am not a tragic writer. If this didn't feel good and bring me happiness and satisfaction, I would not do it. I would go find something to do that did bring me satisfaction. When I when I didn't sell a book for eight years, I didn't sell a word, I had to make peace with the idea that I was going to write uh. because I write. I wasn't going to write because I sold. I had not had a bestseller from 90, 90 to 98. I couldn't sell a word, not a word. Really? And it was very hard for me because my kids were in college. Oh and I goodness. was getting some dribbling uh, royalties from earlier yeah. books. but. I didn't get any advances. I didn't get any, you know, any book sales. And I just, I thought, I asked myself the question every morning. You gonna write today? Why? Are you gonna write because you like writing? Because mm. you, you might as well forget writing for the money. Because right. there is no money. And um, I had to make peace with the idea that I might never be a best-selling author because it, I'd been at it for 30 years and I hadn't been a best-selling author. I watched more people slide by me. Good friends, I bet. you know, got, went on to be rich and famous. I had all but given up on that. So I decided I was gonna write the kind of book I wanted to read and devil take the hindmost. And that's what I did. So after eight years, it had to feel so much better. It did. I met, I met a woman at a writer's conference. Um, I was there to give a conference on novel writing. Of what an irony. I couldn't sell, <laughs> couldn't sell a novel, but I was really good at teaching it. Um, and I met Diane Moggy from Harlequin, and she was putting together a new uh, line of um, mainstream women's fiction. And I loved her. And I loved the program she was putting together. And I sent her, um, I sent her a book. And she, she bought, not only bought it, it was the first book Harlequin published for me. And they have now published 50. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So I think we're out of time, but. Do you have any closing thoughts you would like to share or anything else? You touched on so many good things and left us with some powerful stuff. No, just remember, um, make yourself happy first. Um, enjoy your children. That's a very brave thing to do and I, a wonderful thing to do. Enjoy them. I was never mother of the year. You know, I'm, um, I, I used to send my kids to school on a stretcher. They were, <laughs> you're not sick. 
<laughs> go to you school. You look fine. There's not that much of a fever. <laughs> Doesn't feel like it's broken to me. Uh, enjoy your children. Enjoy your work. Enjoy your your home, and and don't you know. Uh, don't stress out over this stuff. It's all going to work out. My favorite quote of all time is, everything will be fine in the end. If it's not yet fine, it's not yet the end. How Good much luck. do we love Robin Carr? <laughs> <laughs>